Fans disappointed as Messi did not play in today's match at Hong Kong Stadium. The security chief says the proposed state secrets in Article 23 legislation won't be limited to government secrets. And the U.S. and Britain strike 36 Houthi targets in Yemen. Hello and welcome to TVB News. As the consultation work for Article 23 legislation is underway, Secretary for Security Chris Tang and Secretary for Justice Paul Lam told TVB News the proposed state secrets law won't be limited to government secrets, but also those from private companies. They include confidential information on critical infrastructure. The two officials said, while criticisms towards the government are still permissible, the expanded incitement charge might outlaw bias and exaggerated censures. The one-month consultation period for national security legislation under Article 23 of the Basic Law will wrap up at the end of this month. The government recommended that it will be an offense if state secrets are disclosed without lawful authority and would likely endanger national security. And state secrets encompass seven areas, including major policy decisions and the city's socioeconomic development. Speaking to TVB News Secretary for Security Chris Tang said they also cover example, state secrets uh, from private companies. Any clearer guidelines to the public so they won't really commit a crime unknowingly? The information doesn't really limit it to government information. It may also include like uh, information relating to uh, uh, critical infrastructure. For example, uh, where we store all those uh, uh, engines that they generate electricity. So that's uh, critical, right? It will be very likely that the, uh, 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 the national security will be affected, will be in danger. But as if the revelation of MTR confidential documents that brought the Sha Tin Central Railing scandal to light also constitutes an offense, Tang said even if it affects the government's reputation, it doesn't necessarily compromise national security. Another proposed class of concern, it can be an offense to disclose what appears to be state secrets. We have to find a new offense to regulate those uh, 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 improper behavior. But they're not state secrets by nature. So. Yeah, but they pretend to be state secret. Mm -hmm. But by doing that, people will believe it is state secret, and then it may also endanger public security, and it may also cause chaotic situation in society. But would that hamstring journalistic work and other whistleblowing efforts? Would the government consider exemption given to maybe journalistic work for the sake of public interest? Such circumstances, the public interest, uh, it, it's uh, it's higher than the risk of such the, uh, the, the national security risks. So in that circumstances, probably we may think, think about that. But I think uh, the threshold will be high, very high, and uh, this is not very often. So in some cases, is it possible for the public interest to override the national security law? Uh, override the risk of national security. Okay, so it's still possible to override lo the law? Yeah, yeah, so we're, we're thinking about it. Tang added negative news or criticisms can be discussed based on facts but should not be exaggerated or embellished. This as the government proposes in its Article 23 legislation plan to expand the incitement offenses covered in existing laws to include those targeting legislative bodies and the central government's offices in Hong Kong. On the possible extraterritorial powers of the proposed legislation, Secretary for Justice Paul Lam told TVB News that would likely be triggered over more severe offenses such as treason. Hong Kong residents or Chinese national, um, they owed the duty of allegiance to our country. It doesn't really matter whether the act is committed within the territory of Hong Kong or outside. And what we recommend is that we will look into the gravity of individual offences, but we will be very careful and ensure that um, the applicability of our offences will be consistent with public international law principles. What about diplomats who need to comment on political cases on behalf of their countries? To the diplomats, um, they are entitled to certain immunity, provided that they behave or act in a way within the boundaries of the law or within the boundary prescribed by the international treaties. 
on whether authorities could bar or delay the meeting between suspects and their lawyers. Paul M said there might be a mechanism in place preventing lawyers from relaying messages from the suspect to other accomplices. The long-awaited match between Inter Miami and Hong Kong 11 finally came today, with the former scoring a 4-1 victory against the SAR. But fans eager to see the Argentine legend in action were sorely disappointed and outraged when the little flea sat on the bench throughout the game. Timothy Lee tells us more. Messi! Messi! Yeah! Many shared the joy and excitement even before entering the stadium. I'm excited for Hong Kong. To be honest, have you had a sporting event of such a long time? We had to see Messi, Alba, Suarez. We're really, really looking forward to it. I'm the greatest fan of Messi. That's why I want to see him just for one time. I have seen Messi here before when he came with Argentina. Ten years ago, no, it wasn't uh, this uh, huge. Now it's livelier because ten years ago, the interest in football, Hong Kong people are not more interested in football. But now the interest is growing. Many people said it was all worth it to come all the way to see their idols match at Hong Kong Stadium today. Some spectators noted Messi mania will continue with their hearts even after the game and look forward to the football legend's next visit to Hong Kong. The atmosphere was tense throughout the first half of the match when Hong Kong scored just three minutes after Inter Miami. But the little flea was still nowhere to be seen on the pitch even halfway through the match. Hong Kong 11's 4-1 loss to their American counterparts added to the disappointment by the 90-minute mark. In the end, the Argentine did not set foot once on the soccer field. Upset spectators began to jeer and boo. Many demanded a refund. This Messi fan said he spent more than $4,800 for tickets, stressing that he looked forward to seeing the football legend live for a long time. But many are wondering what impact there will be after the football legend's no-show. Timothy Lee, TVB News. Today marks the start of spring. Mist could be seen along the coast this morning with the observatory of forecasting temperatures in the city to drop 11 degrees on the 9th of this month. Humidity remains high in the city with effects of the monsoon arriving at the South China coast by Wednesday evening. The weather is forecast to improve in the next one or two days owing to the dry continental airflow. The temperature in the city is set to drop to around 11 degrees between the 8th and 10th of this month. Some health specialists warned of a rebound in influenza cases as temperatures in the city drop. Meanwhile, the mainland reported heavy snow and rain in the central and eastern regions. Weather authorities have issued warnings for blizzards and heavy fog. Besides affecting traffic, the conditions have led to a number of injuries, including 22 people hurt by a collapsed ceiling in Hunan province. Many areas in Hunan province saw an increase of 20 centimeters of snow within the last 12 hours. Several highways were subject to traffic regulations. The ceiling of a tea house in Jiangjiajie city collapsed because of the weather effects. Witnesses say many failed to escape in time as they were watching a performance. The poor weather conditions could be seen in Wuhan city in Hubei province as well, where large numbers of trees fell under the weight of the snow. Mainland Meteorological authorities forecast as heavy snow in the north to continue until the 6th of February. The United States and Britain said they had struck 36 Houthi targets in Yemen on Saturday in a fresh wave of regional assaults. The strikes are meant to further disable Iran-backed groups such as the Houthis that have attacked American and international interests in the wake of the Israel-Hamas war. On Friday, the U.S. carried out 85 strikes against Iran-linked targets in Iraq and Syria in retaliation for the killing of three American soldiers in Jordan. Washington once more did not directly target Iran, but the Houthis say they will respond. Nasty Karim with more. Royal Air Force Typhoon FGR-4 fighter jet taking off on a mission to bomb targets in Yemen. The UK joined American F-A-18 jets and various US destroyers in launching attacks on the 36 Yemen-based Houthi targets. The aim is to weaken the Houthis' ability to attack merchant shipping in the Red Sea. Sana'a, Hajjah, Damma and al baida in Yemen were among the areas targeted. Iraq on Saturday summoned the deputy chief of mission of the US embassy in Baghdad, David Berger, to make a formal protest over Friday's bombardment. Iran has denied any influence over militias in the Middle East, though Tehran is believed to be funding these groups. The Yemeni group said they will continue to target U.S., British and Israeli-linked vessels in solidarity with the people of Gaza. 
Houthi military spokesman Yahya Saria said the group was not deterred and will not let the coalition attacks go without a response and consequences. Iran's foreign ministry spokesperson Nasser Kanani said the U.S.-U.K. strikes are another adventurous and strategic mistake that will only result in regional instability. The Biden administration said it does not want a war with Iran, with Iranian political analyst Mohammad Marandi saying it is a president's attempt to appear strong in an election year. The United States carried out this attack for internal consumption. The Biden administration wants to look strong. Things are not going well for the United States, both at home and abroad. And so he carried out these strikes, but it had no real impact on the ground. Nazri Karim, TVB News. The Israel Defense Forces, or IDF, says it is ready to attack Hezbollah in Lebanon if provoked as tensions rise away from the Gaza Strip. The IDF says it has hit more than 34,000 targets in Lebanon since the outbreak of the war with the group Hamas in Gaza. This says Israeli troops focus on the south of the territory after withdrawing from the north. Gaza officials say more than 27,200 people have been killed since Israel launched its offensive in response to the militia attacks on October 7th. Naspi Karim again. Gaza City in the north of the Strip. People. people returning to a city destroyed after Israeli troops withdrew from the area to focus on southern Gaza. Residents report Hamas-employed police officers and government workers have returned to the city, some employees even receiving 200 US dollars in salary. Hamas said the police have been deployed to maintain order and prevent looting, their very presence going counter to Israel's stated goal to cripple the group's ability to govern the Strip. The death toll, meanwhile, continues to rise, with Israel continuing its bombardment of areas in the south. 17 people were reportedly killed in two separate hits in the southern city of Rafah, where Palestinians have been told to go to avoid Israeli strikes. The United Nations is warning that Rafah is becoming a pressure cooker of despair as thousands flee into the city from various parts of southern Gaza. This week, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said the offensive will move to Rafah soon. In central Gaza, the last working CT scanner in the city, with staff at the Al-Aqsa Hospital in Dar al-Bala saying they are facing severe shortages. They say procedures such as blood transfusions were becoming more difficult to carry out because of a lack of medicines to test for hepatitis or HIV. In Brussels, the European Union's foreign policy chief said the decision by the U.S. and other countries to suspend funding to the U.N.'s Palestinian Relief Agency is punishing two million people. UNRWA's feeding two million people, providing 30,000 medical assistance per day, providing schools to more than 400,000 people. <laughs> Who can substitute that overnight? But we cannot punish two million people by depriving them from the support that UNRWA is providing. Who will take care of that? Nazri Karim, TVB News. Still ahead. Joe Biden sweeps to victory in the first official Democratic presidential primary in South Carolina. Raging forest fires killed at least 46 people in Chile. And the seven-day Lunar New Year fairs get into business. Welcome back. U.S. President Joe Biden swept to victory in the South Carolina Democratic primary. He comfortably saw off two other candidates in the first officially sanctioned race of the party's nominating season. David Garrett reports. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all? A new day and a new test for President Joe Biden as Democratic Party voters in South Carolina went to the polls. The state's primary officially kicking off Biden's nominating process. Democratic National Committee Chairman Jamie Harrison took donuts to workers at the polling stations. They were not exactly rushed off their feet. Voters came in a trickle with the turnout low. An indication perhaps, as some polls have shown, that a section of Democrats are unhappy with Biden. A day earlier, the president had been at Dover Air Force Base for the dignified transfer of three US military service personnel killed in Jordan last weekend. Hours later, Biden ordered retaliatory strikes on Iran-backed targets in Syria and Iraq. Republicans have said Biden was too slow to respond. Iraq condemned the military action, warning of a devastating impact on the region. Would Democratic voters approve? 
I want to show my support for my president, and I feel that uh, a lot of people are very apathetic about primary votes, and some people feel that he's too old, but I do not, because I feel that he's done a fabulous job, and he has not done anything to hurt our country, only to enhance. I like um, the fact that we haven't gone into a recession that everyone was predicting, considering the uh, choices that we'll have in November, I think Joe Biden's the best man. Biden was always going to do well here. He won over 96 percent of the vote. It was black voters in South Carolina that helped revive his run to the White House in 2020. Biden will almost certainly get the go-ahead to run for re-election, possibly against Donald Trump as the Republican nominee. The former president and front-runner will face Nikki Haley in her home state in the South Carolina Republican primary in three weeks. Some said they want to get behind Biden now out of fear of a Trump return. I don't believe that he serves the best interest of my country, my country, our country. Um, I also don't think that he is a true representative of what most of the Republican Party believes. Um, I could even get behind Nikki Haley in a, in a tough day, but I, Donald Trump is not what this country needs again. Biden was at his campaign HQ in Delaware during voting. He was right to be confident of a resounding success among Democrats in South Carolina, but was also thinking about Trump. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm feeling good about where we are. I really am. You know, uh, the folks uh, are starting to focus in. And the guy we're running against, uh, he is uh, he's not for anything. He's against everything. Uh, no, I mean, it. it's, a, it's the weirdest campaign I've ever been engaged in. This is more of a mission. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot lose this campaign for the good of the country. David Garrett, TVB News. The Chilean government is urging thousands of people to evacuate the central city of Vina del Mar after raging forest fires killed at least 46 people on Saturday. On the streets, families improvised a quick evacuation, some carrying suitcases and accompanied by their pets. At least 1,100 homes in a densely populated city have been destroyed, with thousands more at risk. Chile's President Gabriel Boric flew over the disaster zone to see the damage for himself, having earlier declared a state of emergency. Firefighters are struggling to put out around 92 fires burning in the center and south of the country, officials say. The El Nino weather pattern is being blamed for droughts and higher than usual temperatures along the west of South America this year. Back locally, the week-long Lunar New Year fairs around the city got into business today. This year's bazaars see the return of dry goods and food stalls for the first time after the pandemic. Take a look. These blooms and blossoms embodying the spirit of renewal, wealth and good fortune to many Chinese households are the mainstay of Hong Kong's Lunar New Year fairs, including the one at Victoria Park. A return of dry goods stalls after four years. Many products are themed with the Year of the Dragon. This year, nine of the city's 15 Lunar New Year fairs also welcome back fast food stalls. This boy said it's more fun with not just flowers being sold, but also food including some traditional Chinese snacks, rock sugar-coated Chinese hawthorn skewers. The stall expects a footfall to at least double compared with pandemic times. At Morse Park in Wang Tai Sin, this food stall manager hopes to earn around $100,000 a day. And the cloudy and drizzly weather did not dampen the festive moods of some local and first-time visitors. I want to buy the, 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 the flower and then bring to home for, uh, uh, I think, for the lucky for the whole year. This is my first time being here and it is very beautiful. In Pakistan, there's no variety of uh, flowers like there. I can look all Chinese tradition here in one place. Some students also try out their entrepreneurial skills at the fair to sell merchandise they designed. This year, this is the first time for us to do the flower market. We wish Hong Kong people good health and prosperity. Feng Yi Chuk These windmills are some of the most popular merchandise in the flower markets. Spinning these wheels, Baker Small is believed to be able to chase away Best Bell and ushering good luck for the new year ahead. But remember to do so in the clockwise direction. Over to the fair in Mong Kok, dragon-themed stickers and tote bags designed by students are up for grabs. All 50 New Year markets will be open for seven days this year. On Lunar New Year's Eve, the fairs will open overnight until 7 a.m. on the first day of the Year of the Dragon. And that's the news. Thank you for watching.